Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. Andy Anderson will be our moderator tonight. And I'd like to first introduce everybody to the college, where we have a, just basically very three little rules, two little rules. One is uh, no personal attacks, and the other one is one fool at a time. <laughs> our illustrious leader, Charlie Paydock, who's our illustrious leader and resident troublemaker, Charlie Paydock, is not here tonight because of some personal reasons, but he will be here next week when we do, me and him do our fake news reason. We have three things that we do at the college. It starts off with a brief announcements period, then we have our speaker who speaks, then we have a question and answer period, and then after that we get up into our infamous rebuttals period where you guys can usually have the four minutes spout off about the subject or not. Anyway, I'd like tonight to introduce our speaker. Right. Tonight we're going to be having a talk on the U.S. election system integrity for the 21st century. What happened on 11-8-16? Lawrence Quick, who is a member who for a number of years served as a state chair for the Illinois Ballot Integrity Project. We are, again, we are recording, but a re speaker has requested that uh, we review it first before it gets posted, so I'll agree with that okay. request. Uh, if we're ready, let's give a round, rousing round of applause to Mr. Lawrence Quick. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. No problem. You need a chair or you want to do something? Sure, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay. Well, good evening and, and welcome everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, over the past few years, I've received an invitation to appear as a speaker and for whatever reason, I had um, other things going on. And last, early this year, when I got an invitation, I thought, hey, this is the time for me to take the plunge and I'm glad that I did. Um, just to give you a little background about myself, um, I first got involved uh, in uh, politics actively in um, uh, 2000. I was invited to a coffee by a colleague of mine. <coughs> I was a, uh, I'm, I'm a university professor and I was teaching at a university out in the western suburbs. And uh, he invited uh, a woman who was running for state representative and also another woman who was running for state senator. And I was uh, so impressed with them because they would take their time, you know, uh, and put in all this effort uh, to try to do something to make our government and our nation uh, better. Uh, a couple of years later, um, I live uh, out in Aurora, Wayne's World, no. party on, excellent, okay. Uh, some of you may be aware that it is, it is the 25th anniversary of the movie Wayne's World, so we're having all sorts of special events out in Aurora. Uh, but uh, back in, in, in uh, early 2002, uh, our incumbent congressman was uh, Dennis Haster, who was the Speaker of the House, and um, uh, Bonnie, who, I, uh, who had run for state representative, I was talking to her on the phone and I said, hey, uh, who do we have running against uh, Dennis Hastert in the fall of 2002? And she says, no one, would you like to run? So I thought, well, gee whiz, Bonnie, I'm going to have to think about that. And I did think about it for a few weeks and no one stepped forward and I thought it was important uh, that our voters had a choice uh, in the general election. So I contacted the party leadership in the 14th district and they got together and they slated me uh, to run against Dennis Haster in the 2002 election. Now, as some of you may know, uh, Denny squeaked by with 74% uh, of the vote. <laughs> um, but I'm happy to say that I'm here tonight uh, free on the street and able to speak with you while he is um, otherwise indisposed. Yeah, okay. Uh, so anyway, but uh, that was a great learning experience for me. Uh, and I realized the importance of grassroots involvement uh, in our government and particularly in our political parties. I, I think um, after the election, um, I uh, worked with Senator Paul Simon. He was very supportive 
Uh, and uh, so uh, together, I developed uh, what's uh, called the Quick and Clean Foundation, uh, which is um, uh, a political action committee that's focused on uh, election system integrity, public campaign funding, uh, ethics in government, uh, the application of quality uh, leadership principles in government. And Senator Simon was very supportive because as I developed each program and each manual, I would send it off to him and he would give me feedback. Uh, you know, he would, uh, and I had some phone calls with him, and when he passed away in, uh, I think it was December of 2003, it was a great loss because he was uh, uh, very supportive for young people, uh, and uh, uh, I, I really miss uh, Senator Simon. Anyway, so uh, I ran in, in, in 2002, and um, on election night, uh, I was, uh, as we were listening to the returns come in, I started to hear about the, some of the Senate races, you know, because this was, uh, 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 yeah, this was the, the midterms, you know, for President Bush, and uh, uh, Walter Mondale lost in, in Minnesota for the Senate race. And there was something that just struck me as very weird about that, because uh, Senator Wellstone had, had like a 7 or 8 percent lead in the polls, and then when his plane crashed, and then the, the party had to uh, recruit a replacement and said Vice President Mondale stepped up, uh, I just couldn't believe that the people of Minnesota uh, wouldn't have uh, elected uh, Vice President Mondale. So in, in 2003 early, um, I read an article by Tom Hartman. Uh, is anyone here familiar with Tom Hartman? Okay, uh, he's, uh, he's on the radio, he's had television shows. I had the pleasure to meet with him in Washington, D.C. in 2003 at a conference put on by Mary Ann Williamson, uh, who was um, uh, working to get a uh, cabinet-level Department of Peace uh, enacted into law. Dennis Kucinich uh, was a, a strong sponsor. And so Tom Hartman was one of the speakers um, out in, uh, in Washington. Well, in, in 2003, uh, he, he was interviewing a, a guy who ran against um, uh, Chuck Hagel in Nebraska, and the title of the article was something like, if you want to win the election, just control the election machine, something like that. And so this was the first uh, I had read about the possible uh, problems that we might be having with computerized election systems. Okay. Now, my academic and professional background, I was an accounting major at DePaul University, and when I graduated, I started out on the audit staff of a big, uh, big eight uh, public accounting firm. Uh, and um, I've also, along the way, I've uh, been an auditing professor. I've taught at a number of colleges and universities. So I understand uh, the characteristics and the qualities of a quantitative information system that can be relied upon. It's dependable. And one of the key features is to have uh, a verifiable audit trail. Now to me, an audit trail is an unbroken chain of hard copy documentation that supports the veracity of quantitative information or financial reports, okay? And as uh, I became more and more familiar with our election systems, both in the state of Illinois, we have I think 102 counties in Illinois and about eight uh, separate election boards. Now in Aurora we have our own election board. Uh, the Ch Chicago has the Chicago Board of Elections. So there are roughly about 110 uh, election authorities administering elections in the state of Illinois. And what I have discovered it, everywhere that I've looked is that we have basically a, a, a virtual lack of independent external review of our election systems. Now, think about all of the organizations that are required to have independent CPAs come in and do an audit of the financial statements and audit of the books, okay? Now, these are for-profit organizations, they're non-profit organizations, okay? Well, why does society insist uh, that uh, these independent CPAs come in and audit the financial records and the financial statements? Any thoughts on that? Should we just trust the financial statements that are presented by management? No. Just trust us? No. So what do we do when it comes to uh, election reports, which are quantitative information reports? Recent. What do the election authorities ask us to do? Trust them. Trust them, okay. Because uh, they don't have independent auditors coming in 
and reviewing their procedures. Uh, basically, the, the audit trail is, is not maintained in a secure fashion. You know, after election night, the ballots uh, are not secured in, in safe locations so that they can be tampered with, they can be substituted. So once the ballots leave the, uh, the polling places, uh, they're vulnerable to fraud and manipulation. Okay? Now, um, before the November election, November 16, Donald Trump warned that the 2016 election would be rigged. Uh, Was he right? Yeah. Yes. Not in the way you think. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So now, okay. Let, let me let me ask, let's do a little informal uh, poll here and survey. Mm -hmm. How many people feel that in general uh, election systems throughout the United States states are safe? and reliable and can be uh, relied upon to generate accurate information. They have high confidence in our election systems. One, two, anyone else? Okay. A couple of bridges we uh, how many of you, how many of you uh, feel that uh, there, there may be some reason for concern as to the accuracy of our election results. Are you going to have a third category of people who are absolutely certain that Please. the whole election system is corrupt? And, uh, Please. Okay, okay. Uh, how many people believe in their heart of hearts <laughs> that our whole election system is corrupt and cannot be relied upon? Yeah, so why not believe Okay, so we have about six or seven. Six, six or seven folks. Now, the great thing that President, uh, that Donald Trump did is that he brought this up when? Before the election, okay? Because the problem is, is that if you're a presidential candidate and you don't bring up the possibility of the uh, of computerized election systems being uh, hacked from inside, or, or rigged from insiders, or hacked from outsiders, and then uh, the uh, election results are reported and you happen to be on the losing end, if you if you bring up uh, the the possibility that you know maybe there's something wrong with these election results, what's the press going to say about you, possibly? So our loser. Yeah, you're you're okay. Now here's here's a, an election uh, integrity question. What three what things what thing does do these three individuals have in common? Um, Al Gore, John Kerry, and Hillary Clinton. They all won the popular vote. Did they? Not, not, uh, not in 2004. Uh, Bush, Bush supposedly won the popular vote in 2004. They all had election, you know, controversy. Those three, they all, they all, the election was stolen from each of the three of them. Okay, now let's assume that that is true, just for the sake of discussion. If that, if that's true, what have those individuals said about that situation? Okay. All right. So, um, you know, personally, I, I think that um, uh, there's an awful lot of evidence to suggest that the 2000 presidential election, the 2004 presidential election, and the 2016 presidential election uh, were were stolen. Okay. That they that that the uh, the, the uh, uh, Gore and Kerry and Clinton were victims of election fraud, okay, uh, and, and, and not just vote flipping, okay, but, uh, you know, illegal purges of, uh, uh, of the voter rolls. Okay, so, now, let's roll back to the uh, Democratic primary and the Republican presidential primary in 2016, okay. Uh, was, were there any charges of uh, computerized election theft in the Democratic primary, where we had Bernie Sanders running against Hillary Clinton? Not that okay. I'm aware of. Okay. Um, now, Election Justice USA put out an excellent report uh, on the, um, and I have that in my notes. Um, it's called Democracy Lost. It's the one, two, three, four, fifth, sixth bullet point. Uh, the 100 page report can be found at electionjusticeusa.org. And I encourage you to look at pages 39 to 41. If you have a, a pen, Write down pages 39 to 41. What was it called? Election. It, it's called. Uh, it's called the Democratic Primary Report. Uh, the organ. The organization that put it together is called ElectionJusticeUSA.org. And the uh, the tables of the exit polls and the reported vote totals, I think, uh, show up on pages 39 through 41. Okay. Now, 
something very interesting happened in the presidential primary. In over, I think about 13 states, Hillary Clinton uh, reported uh, vote, voting results uh, exceeded the sampling margin of error. Okay, so there was a flip from Bernie Sanders to Hillary Clinton that exceeded the, the margin of error between what the media exit polls said should have happened and what the computers reported, okay? Now this happened in about 13 different states where votes were apparently flipped from Sanders to Clinton. Now, election justice estimated that if you, if you look at all of those states, and, and it wasn't just, and then you go into states like Illinois and California, uh, that uh, Bernie probably lost about 200 pledged delegates. Now, uh, if he had those 200 pledged delegates, he would have gone into the Democratic uh, convention basically neck and neck with Hillary uh, in terms of pledged delegates, right? And then there was the super delegates that would have decided the nomination, which, you know, if I had to predict, would, would have gone to Hillary because she was a longtime member of the Democratic Party. Bernie has been an independent. So why should the superdelegates, you know, if it was a 50-50 split, you know, so, but, but, but that didn't happen. Now, in, but in the Republican primary, with the same uh, uh, exit polling organizations, with the same election systems, okay, um, with, the, with the exception of Texas, uh, all of the presidential primary Republican results, uh, uh, the reported results fell within the margin of error of all the exit polls. So basically, the Republican presidential primary, with the exception of Texas and I think one other state, uh, was basically a clean primary. Now, people would say, well, you know, maybe the exit polls don't work anymore. Well, how is it that the same exit polling organizations, using the same election systems, uh, you know, uh, re uh, doing the, uh, the uh, polling on the same day, uh, uh, the result is on the Republican side, you have a clean primary election, but on the Democratic side, you know, 13 or more states were flipped uh, from, uh, from Bernie to Hillary, and those, those margins were outside the sampling margin of error. So if you, if you add up the probability, calculate the probability of all that happening, all going against uh, Bernie, all for Hillary, you're in the ones of, of millions, of, of one in millions of possibility. Is that why you think Hillary has been so low-key on the whole thing with Trump and uh, not really saying anything about well, I, I, I don't know. stealing the election? I mean, I mean uh, Al Gore and John Kerry and Hillary Clinton could do a great thing for our democracy if they came forward and said, we have mountains of evidence and analysis of the 2000 election, 2004 election, uh, 2016 election, uh, you have to pretty much be have your, you know, I don't want to see, I don't want to see, I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear, I'm not going to say anything. Uh, if they came out and said, we have a serious problem with the integrity of our election systems, people would listen, okay? People would pay attention. Now the question is, why haven't they done that? Why haven't they stepped up to protect the integrity of our uh, uh, democracy and our and, and the strength of our election systems? It's going both ways. Like you said, she cheated Bernie, and Trump cheated her. So well, uh, now the thing is, I, I'm not at all certain that it was Hillary Clinton operatives that were flipping those votes uh, away from Bernie towards her. I think those were other individuals who did not want Bernie Sanders anywhere near uh, the Democratic nomination. That's my personal opinion. Okay? So if you go to that electionjusticeusa.org report and you go to pages 39 to 41, you'll see the media exit poll projections and then you'll see the computer uh, vote totals and you'll see uh, the flipping that occurred in the Democratic primary but not in the Republican presidential primary. And we've never had a situation where we've had that kind of data. Someone had a question? Yes, sir. I think you're making a very important point that I have not heard anybody else make. Yes. And, both, and, and I can trace the origin of it back to the best president we've had since Truman, Lyndon Baines Johnson. Okay. And there's a, Tom Hartman on WCPT often plays a recording of a conversation between LBJ and Edward Dirksen, who was really a pretty good senator considering he was a Republican. Mm -hmm. And uh, Johnson reports, this is uh, in 68, and, and during the election campaign where Humphrey was running against Nixon, and Johnson reports that the CIA or someone told them that Nixon's people were telling 
of uh, the North Korea, North uh, Vietnamese negotiators in Paris that they shouldn't make a deal with Johnson. They should wait until Nixon is elected and they'll get a better deal. And Johnson and, and the good old Edward McKinley Dirksen both agreed that that was treason. But they participated in the treason by failing to announce it, report it, and sick the FBI and the Marines and everybody on Nixon. Oh. And that is the first instance I know of of this kind of um, um, conspiracy between the, the noble non-traitors and the traitors. Okay, now tonight I am not going to address issues of any kind of outside foreign influence or manipulation on the presidential well, election. This was domestic manipulation. No, well, whatever. Uh, oh, okay. well, well, our focus, and what I'm going to talk about tonight is, uh, is we have a solution in Illinois uh, to the, the world, would clean up our election system in all 110 election districts, you know, with, uh, and it's called the Illinois Election Integrity Act. Uh, and it was, it's been introduced by uh, uh, representative, state representative Linda Chapalavia of uh, the 83rd district uh, out in Aurora. She's my state rep. And then uh, State Senator Christina Castro, uh, who is a freshman Democratic senator from Elgin in the 22nd district. And I'm going to be talking about the Illinois Election Integrity Act uh, shortly. Okay, now, um, if you, there are three excellent uh, documentaries on our election system integrity. Two of them are available on YouTube. And if you go to the very last page of your handout, I just kind of like to uh, prime your, your, your neural network. Um, it's down at the bottom of the page, the very last page in bold print, uh, where it says resources to consult. Last page of your handout. Very last page of your handout at the very bottom. Okay, does anyone see that? Got it, yeah. You got another one? Uh, there's we have this in the back, but I'll get you one. Yeah, okay. I brought 25 uh, copies. If we run short, I can, uh, if you give me your email, I can send you an electronic file of the handout. Okay. Now, so what I would really encourage people to do is to take 90 minutes out of their life, and you don't have to do it in one sitting, but if you go to YouTube, you know, and you just, you put in Stealing America Vote by Vote, uh, this is a, a documentary that was released in, on August 1st, 2008. It's produced and directed by Dorothy Fadiman, narrated by actor Peter Coyote, and it's a superb uh, summary of what's been going on with our election systems vis-a-vis -vis computers going back to the year 2000, the presidential election. Uh, and uh, uh, computer science experts are interviewed, uh, pollsters are interviewed, attorneys are interviewed, uh, and uh, see, Al Gore, how long has Al Gore been warning the world about climate change and global warming? He, didn't he start that in the 70s? Yeah. He, they were looking at data of the buildup of carbon gases in the environment, and he actually uh, did a documentary and won an Academy Award for his documentary. And what was that called? An Inconvenient Truth. And it, it's, not, it's not our only Inconvenient Truth, ladies and gentlemen. Now, what's the difficulty in convincing uh, the majority of, of, of uh, thinking uh, men and women that, in fact, we really are having a buildup of, of carbon gases, that it really, in fact, that it is profoundly affecting our environments? Can we visibly see the buildup of the carbon gases occurring? I can't see it. I can't see it. Now, who's Edward Snowden? <laughs> What 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 did what did he, what did uh, what was that documentary that Laura Poitras and Glenn Greenwald uh, put out? Citizen Four. Did anyone see Citizen Four? Okay. Now the thing is, is that my understanding is that with the with the information that that uh, uh, Snowden released, uh, it pretty much confirmed that the United States government was illegally conducting surveillance on American citizens. Okay, using computers and the internet. Now let's assume that that's true, okay? Let's assume that the U.S. government is illegally conducting uh, surveillance, okay? On our emails, telephone calls, uh, you name it. Now, can we see that happening? Can we see that surveillance actually occurring? 
Now let's go to our computerized selection systems. Uh, uh, computer science experts from Rice, John Hopkins University, um, uh, uh, Harry Hursty, who's a Finnish um, computer expert, uh, uh, Doug Jones from Iowa, uh, they all agree that the computerized uh, voting systems that were purchased with the Help America to Vote Act money in 2002, they're all imminently insecure. They're all a subject to insider rigging and outsider hacking. To my knowledge, none of those computerized voting systems has ever passed U.S. minimum information technology security standards, okay? Uh, and so, uh, so what we have here are computer uh, systems that are uh, very easily rigged. Uh, uh, I saw one, on one of the documentaries, you'll see a computer science professor show you how what you do is you open up the door to, uh, to an OptiScan machine, you take out the memory card, you put in the memory card, which is like a credit card that has the malware on it. You hit the boot up button. You take the memory card out. You put in the the, the original memory card. You close the door, and and that that system has been infected with a virus that will flip votes and rig an election, and then it will erase the the computerized the, the software instructions after the job is done. And that 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 rigging that insider rigging can be done within 90 seconds. Okay? And if you look at, at, the, at the security of our computer voting systems, where are they stored? Uh, they're brought out two weeks before the election and they're sitting in some school, they're sitting in some church, okay? A uh, piece of cake to go in and, 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 and substitute a, a malicious uh, memory card. I'll tell you why. Yeah, okay, so now uh, more and more people, the National Election Defense Coalition, and that's uh, one of your resources, uh, uh, number three down at the bottom, uh, and I have the link there. They have a superb website, and I was just looking at their homepage, and there was a congressional briefing that occurred, I think within the last week or so, uh, where they have uh, the former head of the CIA uh, and one of the folks that worked with him, and then they have some computer science uh, experts, a professor from Michigan, and they're all talking about how, how vulnerable our election systems are to, to rigging and hacking, and this is no longer acceptable. Now, what just happened in Georgia and South Carolina? The Republican, Republicans won. What, 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 what's the nature of the election systems that were used in Georgia and South Carolina? Or did voters cast their votes on paper ballots? Only if they, only if they did the absentee voting, okay? Um, uh, did, okay, so basically in South Carolina and Georgia, the elections are run on touchscreen machines. They're called DRE, Direct Record Electronic. There's absolutely no audit trail. There are no paper ballots created by the voters to examine. There's not even a voter verified paper audit tape that we have here in Illinois if you decide to cast your vote on a touchscreen, okay? There is absolutely no paper. So um, the, the results, the unofficial results, showed that, um, I have this here, that um, the Republican Georgia, the 6th District, the unofficial results, show the Republican Karen Handel uh, earning 134,000 votes, 51.9%. John Ossoff uh, earning 124,000 votes at 48.1%. In South Carolina, Republican Ralph Norman uh, earning uh, 44,000 votes at 51%. And Archie Parnell earning 42,000 at 47.9%. Now, if you went to those election boards and said, can you please uh, demonstrate to me, can you prove that these vote totals that you're publishing are accurate and correct, could they do that? Do, is there an audit trail in Georgia or South Carolina that would permit uh, an independent external review to verify the accuracy of these computer vote totals? There is not, there is not, there is not. In Pennsylvania, over 80% of the votes are cast on paperless touchscreen machines. Now, uh, I understand last week you had a speaker that talked about the Wisconsin recount that the Green Party initiated. Okay, now I had the opportunity this year to attend two voting justice conferences put on by the Green Party. I met Dr. Jill Stein and spoke with her at both conferences. Uh, and what, um, uh, uh, what, 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 ha what happened, what, they, they refer to their recount effort because uh, if, if you, I, I have a, um, if anyone's interested, the, uh, 
I, I know the Wisconsin Recon Group, they put out a 19-page final report, okay, uh, and they uh, were allowed, there was hand counting that went on of ballots in Wisconsin, but not in, in, in the largest counties, okay, but, but as a result of the hand counts that were occurred in a lot of the counties, uh, not all of them, not Milwaukee County, not Waukesha County, not Racine County, because the judge ruled that the, the ballots could just be fed into the same uh, Diebold machines or the uh, whatever uh, computer voting systems there were. And so, of course, the vote counts are, are, are going to be uh, identical. But um, what the uh, audit group, and I had a chance to uh, meet with Damian Christensen and Karen McKim, and they did a, a superb job uh, in, the, in the recount the, uh, of the uh, of, the, of the ballots in the counties that, that they examined, uh, there were 17,681 votes that had to be changed. 17,681 votes that had to be changed, and uh, I think, uh, what was the margin that, that Trump allegedly earned in Wisconsin? Less than 1%. Was, was it like around 10,000 votes yeah, or something? Uh, it was 30,000, it was, it was 100,000 votes spread amongst the three states, Pennsylvania, yeah, Wisconsin. Correct. Right. In Michigan, so it was about 30,000. Yeah, so when President Obama said that all of the votes that were cast uh, were counted and counted correctly, well, Mr. Former President, uh, the, the audit recount team disagrees with you. They found 17,681 misreported votes just in the Wisconsin counties that they were allowed to do hand count audits in. Okay, so. Personally, I think with, with, uh, the, the, the recounts that the Green Party requested for Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, that's the smoking gun, okay? Uh, were uh, recounts allowed to go forward in the states of Michigan and the states of Pennsylvania? No. Were they allowed to go forward? No, they were blocked by court actions. The, the Trump supporters filed lawsuits and prevented recounts from occurring in Pennsylvania and Michigan. And then in Wisconsin, there was a full state recount. But the problem was, is in the largest counties, uh, they could have hand counted the paper ballots in Milwaukee County and Waukesha County, but the election administrators chose not to and just run them through the same computerized uh, uh, vote tabulators. Any thoughts or comments? Uh, yeah. No, I'm, I'm trying to get a waitress. <laughs> oh, okay. Wait, wait. <laughs> Here she is behind you. Does Diebold control all the voting machines in the country, or no? You know, what significant amount. Yeah, Diebold and ESNS and Heart uh, Heart InterCivic, I think. Uh, but Diebold, I think, has now been renamed Dominion Voting Systems. Uh, but yeah. So what's the problem? The problem is, is that we have turned the uh, the the uh, administration of our elections over to private corporations. I mean, the the, the election authorities have outsourced. Uh, the, the, the computer voting machines, the, the software that runs the voting machines, uh, the tabulation of the votes, the reporting of the votes, they're all done by private corporations. And the election authorities are not even allowed to review the software that runs these voting machines because the uh, vendors claim this is proprietary property. And so election authorities and the public cannot review the code and the, and, and the programming that runs our election system. Yes, sir. The 17,681 votes. Yeah, were, were, were misreported. Yeah, just they in all those go one direction. Or they, go, they went both directions. No, they were, in other words, in the, um, in the, in the, in the counties uh, that, um, that, that, that they were auditing, so in some cases votes had to be added, in some cases votes had to be subtracted, but, there were, but, but there were, they had to be shifted because what the reported the, the totals that they certified as being true and correct upon the recount and the audit were not true and correct. And so those counties had to either adjust vote totals up or adjust vote totals down. And the total number of adjustments came out to 17,681 votes. But that's just only for a portion but of the state. Did that benefit Trump? Um, well, you'd, you'd have to talk to the audit team. If you're interested, I can send you uh, a, the full copy. It's, it's in, I have it in PDF form, um, but I, I'm not in a position uh, to get into the details. But to me, the fact that 17,681 votes had to be either added or subtracted from incorrect totals that were previously certified as being correct is a serious, serious problem. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, I. I, I 
This is the first time that I have heard that uh, they claim that this is proprietary and that even uh, state and national officials cannot have access to this. Um, has uh, no elected uh, representative uh, in Chicago, for example, uh, which is where we're from, mm -hmm. um, has uh, nobody uh, screamed bloody murder over this? I mean, if I were if I were a member of Congress or if I were a state legislator, sure. and they said you can't look at that because it's ours, right. I would say this will be your last contract. Uh, oh, uh, back to the old ways. Right, right. I mean, personally, I, I don't I don't see how that's justified. T turning over our election systems to private corporations, which typically have very close ties to one political party. They really do. If you look at who they are and what their political affiliate, like Walden O'Dell in 2004, uh, he was the CEO of Ebel, okay, and uh, he pledged. He, he was he was on the Bush Cheney uh, re-election team, and he pledged to deliver uh, Ohio's electoral votes in 2004 to President Bush. Now Robert F. Kennedy uh, Jr. wrote an article in, in the Rolling Stone. Uh, about the 2004 election, and what he discovered and who he interviewed was Chris Hood, who is a former employee of Diebold, and they were going around um, in, in the state of Georgia in 2002 uh, administering uh, illegal software patches in, in Democratic counties to computer voting systems, because in 2002, Georgia went to an entirely paperless touchscreen system, okay, and so uh, incumbent Senator Max Cleland, who was leading in the, the pre-election polls, lost a surprising uh, loss uh, to the Republican, and then the Democratic governor, uh, who was also leading in the, uh, the exit in the pre-election polls, also lost on these unverifiable 2002 uh, Diebold uh, uh, touchscreen machines. Now these are the same machines that were used in the, in the Georgia's uh, sick uh, district uh, six special election last week. The same machines that were used in 2002 were used uh, last week in, in that special election. What percent is electronic in America, or what percent is hand counted? I'm I, I'm not sure, but by far, the, I, I'm going to say that you know probably close to 90 percent or more of our votes are counted by computers. Could be higher than 90 percent. Like in New Hampshire, uh, they have a lot of uh, election districts where they still use hand-counted paper ballots. Well, what's in Chicago with the paper? <coughs> those, are, those, those are those are those are scan Those are you know, the the voter. You you can choose right to fill out a, a ballot card, right? No, you're given a ballot card. Oh, you can't you can't use a, a touch screen when no, you go yeah, to the polling place. No, we don't have touch screens. Yeah, they do. Not in Chicago. Chicago. Yes, they do. I no, think they have paper, paper, paper ballots. That's not true. They have touch screens. No, we too. don't. They do. Well, Different no, we don't. Might be you have both. No, we don't. Yes, I, I, I think you have both because of because of the disability requirements. They, they have you paper. No, I do touch screen. Okay, all right. Let we can discuss this offline if you don't mind. We can discuss this offline. I know, but they have both. Right, I agree. We we have both out in Aurora. Okay. And they have both in Chicago. Yeah. No. You know, as a yes, point of order, you don't have to take questions right now. Okay. You can deliver your okay. talk, and then there's a question period. Okay. So okay. you don't have to. Sure. Okay. Um, all right. So why don't we go to the? Um, uh, let's look at the uh, at the, uh, the the uh, page two and page three, and I'll explain what these tables uh, represent. Okay. Um, Jonathan Simon uh, has written a, a, a book called Code Red. Uh, and he is a really a, a excellent uh, researcher. He's a, a, a former professional uh, pollster. Uh, he has a law degree. Um, uh, and uh, uh, he, what happened uh, in 2004, it was election night, and he had a splitting headache, so he went to bed. He told me this uh, personally. At about 10.30, he was living out on the East Coast, his mother called and woke him up, okay? And so uh, he got the idea that, well, I'm going to, he went on t the, the CNN uh, website and he thought, I'm going to start capturing the exit poll projections for the pre presidential race around the country. Now, what happened is that the Edison Matovsky, this, this was the organization hired by the six major media uh, organizations, their server crashed for about 30 minutes at about 10.30 in the evening which left all of this unadjusted exit poll data on the CNN website, 
which not only John Simon was able to capture, but Dr. Steve Freeman uh, was able to get about 18 screenshots on a different computer, uh, and, 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 he, and he concurred with the, with the totals that John Simon uh, had published online. And what that indicated was that indeed, Kerry uh, 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 won, the exit polls predicted Kerry would win Ohio, he would win Florida, he would win Nevada, and New Mexico, and Iowa, okay? And, and those, those, those states, if given to Kerry, would have given Kerry uh, the victory. John Zogby, when he was doing his polling, uh, predicted that Kerry was going to come out with about 310 or so electoral results. Folks, now if, if you go to these um, documentaries, you'll see Zogby being introduced. And to me, you can sense, sense that he's really pissed off at what happened in 2004. Now, the National Association of Public Opinion Research has a code of ethics. And their code of ethics requires that pollsters make available to researchers and academics uh, the raw polling data so that their methods can be reviewed and checked. Uh, what happened in, in 2002 when the Republicans uh, won unexpected Senate victories in Bush's midterm is that the Voter News Service was doing the exit poll and they had a glitch. And so none of the exit polls that were taken in 2002 were released to the public. Now in 2004, uh, Edison Matoski would not release the raw exit poll data to researchers like Dr. Steve Freeman and John Simon. And so uh, they have been claiming that the exit polling data is proprietary information. John Zogby says absolutely not, that's false. The exit polling data is not proprietary information. So the problem is, is that we could get to the bottom of these discrepancies you know, if we could get have access to the to the raw polling data. So, if you look at the on page two, the presidential election exit polls, you can see uh, there are four states that are highlighted in blue and pink. Okay, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Florida. Now, let me interpret the colors for you. In North Carolina, the exit polls predicted that Clinton would win that state by a margin of two percent. But when the, when, the, uh, when the computers reported the vote totals, uh, that gave uh, Trump a margin of 3.8%. So if you take 2% and 3.8%, what does that add up to? 5.9%. That's called the red shift, a shift from a, a, from a blue Democratic candidate to a red Republican candidate. Now notice that that red shift is 5.9%. Is and that provided a discrepancy greater than the sampling margin of error of 2.8 percent. So this is this is very suspicious. When the when the reported results differ from the outside the margin of error, they exceed the margin of error. It's a red flag. Okay. Let's go to Pennsylvania. The uh, the the uh, consortium exit poll predicted that Hillary would carry Pennsylvania by what margin? By what margin? 4.4. Uh, but the, the, uh, the, the margin that, that Trump was given with the reported vote totals was how much? 1.1. So if you had 4.4 and 1.1, what do you get? 5.6. That's a red shift of 5.6%, 1.8% outside the sampling margin of error. Let's go to Wisconsin. The exit polls predicted that Hillary would win Wisconsin by what percent? 3.9, but Trump was given a, a margin of what percent with the reported vote? 0.9%. Uh, What's 3.9 plus 0.9? 4.8. So a 4.8% redshift outside the sampling margin of error by 1.4%. Let's go to Florida, okay? Uh, the exit polls predicted that Hillary would have a margin of how much? 1.4. Trump was given a reported margin of how much? 1.3, what was the red shift? 2.6%. Okay, now, it doesn't stop at the presidential race. Let's go to the Senate race. Now, how many seats do the Democrats need to pick up in November to take control of the Senate? How many Senate seats do they need to take away from the Republicans in 2016 to take control of the Senate? Does anyone remember? Four. Four. It, uh, four. Five if, if, uh, if uh, Hillary didn't win and Tim Kaine was not vice president. But if Hillary won and Tim Kaine was vice president, the Democrats only needed to pick up four Senate seats and they would have taken control of the Senate. 
Okay, let's go to page three, the Senate elections, exit polls versus reported vote totals. Let's look at the state of Missouri. Uh, the Missouri, the Democratic candidate was predicted to uh, win that state by what percent? 7.5. Uh, but the Republican candidate won the state by what percent? 3.1. Uh, what's 3.1 and 7.5? 10.7. Uh, the discrepancy, the shift outside the sampling margin of error, 5.8 percent. Wisconsin, Russ Feingold was predicted to win that state by the exit polls by what percent? 3.9. Uh, his, uh, the Republican was uh, re was given a margin of what percent? 3.4. What's the red shift? 7.3. What's 3.9 and 3.4? You with me? 7.3. 7.3. Outside the sampling margin of error, 3.7 percent. State of Pennsylvania, the Democratic candidate was uh, predicted to win that state by what percent? 2.8. The Republican uh, reportedly won that state by what percent? 1.7. What's 2.8 and 1.7? 4.5. And the outside the sampling margin of error of 4.7 percent. Now, I asked Jill Stein when I was in when we they, they had the voting justice voting justice conference in Milwaukee. I said, uh, Jill, what uh, motivated you to request? the recounts because it was a horrendous, a horrendous undertaking. They had to recruit 350 volunteers in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, the, the Wisconsin was charging the Green Party how much to conduct the recount? Three million dollars, four million dollars, when uh, it, uh, before the most that a, a re statewide recount had cost was like, you know, eight or nine hundred thousand dollars, something in that area. So now they're raising up the recount fees to three, four million dollars. Okay. In one week, in Thanksgiving, the Green Party raised about $7.5 million to fund the recount efforts in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. And the thing about recounts is that you have to hire lawyers and they're expensive. And it's an expensive proposition, uh, but the Green Party went ahead and did that. Now my understanding is that they have a lawsuit in Pennsylvania where they're still trying to get a recount of, of the presidential vote count in Pennsylvania, okay, and and one of the one of the interesting things is that there were a lot of votes that were early voting or provisional voting in Pennsylvania. Uh, if you added them all up, uh, there was plenty of uh, margin for Hillary Clinton to be to win uh, uh, Pennsylvania if those provisional and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, absentee votes uh, had been uh, actually counted, and they were not. They were not counted in the recount, okay. So, uh, so what we have here is some pretty powerful evidence, especially to um, uh, statisticians and, and pollsters, that would indicate that indeed the 2016 election was rigged, not just for Donald Trump, but for in key Senate races. Okay. Uh, any, any thoughts or comments on that? Yes, sir. I, I'd like you to have uh, explain again, why didn't the Democrats complain? Explain that again. You said it, but I didn't get it. Yeah, no. Um, we don't know why the, why the, the, the because if, if you go back to 2000, okay, in, in 1996, Chuck Hagel won an amazing victory in the state of Nebraska, uh, both in the Republican primary and in, and in the general election. And what was the thing? His company, American Information System, uh, was a computer voting company, counted about 80% of the votes that were cast in Nebraska. So the voting machine company that Chuck Hagel owned uh, counted the votes that gave him a, an upset victory in the Republican primary and an upset victory in the general election. Okay? Now, the Republican, the Democratic candidate who was victimized did complain, and he went to Tom Hartman, and he was interviewed by Tom Hartman, but he was not part of the Democratic establishment. <coughs> So the question is, why didn't John Kerry, uh, why did he concede when there were hundreds of thousands of votes in Ohio that hadn't even been counted? And, and Mark Crispin Miller, okay, who we're going to be having an election integrity conference. I have uh, information. If you look at your last page of your resources, you can see that on September 16th, out in Warrenville at the IBEW Hall, we're going to be having an election integrity conference. We're bringing in national speakers, 
John Simon, Mark Crispin Miller, Bob Fertrakis, and others, okay? And then we're going to be providing a two-hour orientation and introduction to our state representatives, our state senators, our election administrators, and the media uh, in laying out the, the problem and the difficulties we're facing with our computerized voting systems. Because um, uh, last year, uh, Lou Lang, who I love, uh, uh, is, who's in House leadership, he came out and he was speaking at an event at Carroll Stream, and I raised my hand and said, Lou, how would you assess the strength of the election integrity in the state of Illinois? And he kind of pauses for a second, and he says, well, you know, I really haven't uh, come across any evidence to suggest that something, you know, might be wrong, okay? Now, in, 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 in Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania, in Michigan, were the, were the auditors, were, were, the, were the recounters allowed access to the evidence? No, they weren't allowed access. They were they allowed access to the software. Uh, were they, were, were, were they required to do hand counts of the paper ballots throughout the state of Wisconsin? No. So, so the big mystery is why, with the Democrats being victimized in 2000 in the presidency, 2004 in the presidency, 2016 in the presidency, I, personally, I don't think this is the first uh, election that Russ Feingold had stolen from him. I think the last one. And then you have the gubernatorial races, okay? Uh, the, the Republicans control the, the assemblies in 32 states across the country. And does anyone know how many states where they have complete control, where they have the governor's chair in both houses? Is that so, 20? I think it's more than that. Could it be 27? <clears throat> I don't know, but some, some very large number. So we're very suspicious that in 2010, when we were all feeling good and we weren't looking, that there was significant election fraud that occurred to give the Republicans these, these, uh, these uh, unexpected uh, sweeps of the state assemblies, the state house, the governor's chair, because then what happened after 2010? What happened in 2010? Citizen United. No, we had our census. And what happens every 10 years after the census? Redistricting. Redistricting. And if you control the governor's chair and both houses, you get to draw the maps. Yep. Which is what happened in Illinois, right? The Democrats controlled all three, so they drew the map. Yes, sir. <coughs> Excellent. Uh, sorry, what is your name? Larry Quick. Larry? Quick. Q-U-I-C-K. Oh, Quick. Very Quick. Good. I think you should run for office. I did run for office. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I guess Dennis asked like, him. Let's see. 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 let us can't wait. Oh, I'm going to wait. Let's see if, if the whole wall collapses. Oh, then we have evidence of a flood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, let me just finish. Yeah, I agree with point. you. Here's my simple thought. The Democrats, the Democratic politicians, every one of them has got a really good thing going for them, whether they win or not. They collect millions. They get interviewed on television. They often have access to very beautiful women. And so they lose. So what? Maybe the next time they'll win. But they don't want to destroy the system that is giving such, giving them such a good life. They are not, they're no more patriotic than the Republicans. We cannot trust the Democrats. Okay. They are never, they are proven. Mo, may I remind you that we have a rebuttal period, please? Okay. All right. Mo, may I remind you we have a rebuttal period, please? Yes, Has there ever been a study done? Um, versus voting patterns when they're before electronic voting versus voting patterns since electronic voting. Well, I'll tell you, there have been studies with the exit polls, okay, where the exit polls going up into 2002 uh, were incredibly reliable. The the media, uh, they were they were spot on. I mean, they, 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 the exit polling, Warren Matosky was one of the developers of, and it's both a science and an art, but they were just spot on. Uh, and then what happened, and, and if you go to these documentaries, I think it's the, um, 
Stealing America, they're going to show you a time series graph that shows you the, how the discrepancies between the reported results and the exit polls started to differ starting in 2002, 2004, 2006. And that's the inception of electronic voting? With, with the introduction of computerized voting systems, all of a sudden we, in, in many elections, you, the exit polls differ from the reported results. But the interesting thing about the, the primary elections last year is that the Republican primary was basically a clean primary with the state of Texas, where the exit polls and the computer vote polls matched within the margin of error. But in over 13 states, same uh, exit polling organizations, same election systems, <coughs> there were over 13 states where the shift went from uh, uh, Bernie to Hillary outside the sampling margin of error. So, did, did they... <coughs> Thank you, you're an angel. Okay, thank you. Uh, is, yes, sir. Is that on purpose that the Republicans supposedly didn't alter the machines or with their Republican primaries versus the well, Democrats? Well, wh wh whoever, or whoever's doing whoever was, was rigging or hacking the system decided that they weren't going to do that in the Republican primary. That's, my, that's my take on it. Because why would they want Trump versus the other Republicans? Well, I mean, the, I, it doesn't make sense. See that now. There's a, there's to me. There's a glitch in the in the um, in the whole reasoning of all that. Because why would the Republicans be clean and the Democrats not? Because certainly the Republican establishment did not want Trump to win. And and and, and, the, and the establishment did not want Bernie Sanders anywhere near. Yeah, the yeah. Nomination. And the Democratic side. But I'm saying yeah. on the Republican side. The Republican establishment did not want Trump. Well, in, in Texas, to get it. Texas was one of the states where the exit polls differed significantly from the computer vote totals. And whose home state is Texas? Carl right. Cruz. Okay. okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Assuming that it were found beyond the shadow of a doubt that, uh, let's say, a gubernatorial election in a major state, uh, you know, had been uh, fraudulently mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. accomplished, yeah. and uh, or uh, this last presidential election uh, had in fact been totally uh, screwed up, yeah. stolen, yes. and there was no and there was no doubt of that. What then? What if impact would this have since these uh, winners? had already been certified, yeah. you know, as the winners, yeah. does this mean we go back to square one and have a, another election? No, I'm not an attorney. You'd have to talk to uh, attorneys who specialize in election law. I think the, the key thing is that once, it's like with the, with the, the uh, electoral college, once the Congress approves the votes of the electoral college, whether those uh, states were stolen or not, that's it. The Congress is, has certified those uh, electoral votes as going to those candidates. Election is over, okay? Uh, and, and, and the thing is, is that in terms of um, what happens with uh, election authorities, uh, the counties, they do a canvas after the election, and then they, then they come out with their official results. Right up for two weeks, the results are always unofficial because they're taking in absentee ballots and, and you know other things are going on. They're checking the results. Uh, but once the uh, election authorities certify that those results are true and correct, um, you know, I think it's, it, then, then, then the, the candidates have this window of opportunity to request a recount, okay? And they can do that, you know, uh, even after the, the, the certification. But I think uh, in the absence of a recount, uh, overturning the results um, that once, you know, I don't think there's any, any going back at this point of unseating elected officials. That's, that's, my, uh, uh, that's my uneducated opinion on that issue. Yes, sir. Sounds pretty educated to me. Well, it's, uh, it's my guess. I would like to respond to the, the Republican establishment didn't want Trump. Mo, we want to get the uh, rebuttals during the rebuttal period. Okay, all right. All right, so, um, okay, so, um, let's, uh, let me just get through the, the last couple of pages of my handout, then we can have rebuttal period. I, or questions. Um, okay, now, someone mentioned a gubernatorial race. What happened in Illinois in 2014? Koch brothers. <laughs> who, are the, who are the major party candidates for governor in 2014? Quinn and Brown. Okay, now, if you would, go to page four of your handout, uh, where you have a little 
multicolored pie chart. Okay. And then after this, I'm going to tell you a story about Scott Walker in Wisconsin. Okay. Um, now, right before, you can see here, uh, these, these are pre-election polls. You can, you can get them off of electionatlas.org. Election and what they did is that right before the election, you can see that Quinn is in red, and it shows that he had a weighted average among three polls, a 3% margin going into the election over rounder, okay? So the weighted average of these three pre-election polls said that Quinn, he had a 3% margin statewide, okay? Now, if you go flip to the next page, which is page five but unnumbered, table two, uh, this table comes out of Mark Crispin Miller's book, Code Red, 2014 edition, okay? Uh, anyway, look at, there's an arrow down at the state of Illinois. Does everyone see the Illinois row? Okay. Now, the exit poll showed that on election day, uh, voters, what percent were favoring Quinn? And what percent were favoring Rounder? 48.5. Okay. Now, let's take a look at the reported vote totals. With the vote count, Rounder uh, was given a, a, a vote percentage of how much? 50.3, and Quinn was given a vote margin of 46.4. Okay, so uh, you can see that the uh, that the exit poll predicted that Quinn should have had at least 48% of the vote. The computers gave him 46.4% of the vote. Uh, that Rounder should have had no more than 48.5% of the vote. The computers gave him 50.3. So you can see here that the discrepancy between the exit poll margin of 0.5% and margins, uh, Rounder's margin of victory uh, with the computer of uh, computer vote totals was a difference of 3.4%. So if you go to the previous page, what does all this mean? The pre-election polls showed Quinn with a statewide lead of 3%. Rounder's official vote margin was 3.9%, 3.92 over Quinn. And so there was a red shift of 6.92% from the pre-election polls to the computer vote report the votes, uh, the, the, com the computer reported vote totals, a 6.9 percent shift from the pre-election polls to what the computer said happened in the election. Now let's go to Scott Walker in the recount in 2012. <clears throat> Remember that he won in 2010, and so they got enough signatures on a petition to hold a recount in 2012. So I, I have this article in my files. Okay. Uh, there was a, a professional uh, exit poll organization doing a statewide exit poll for the media. And when the polls closed at 7 o'clock, they said that it was basically a 50-50 dead heat split in the exit polls. But within an hour, the computerized vote totals that showed up gave a Walker a 7.7% margin in the votes. Okay, so we, you know, so think about uh, the governor of Michigan. You know, think think about Scott Walker. Now, <clears throat> suppose see the problem is is that we don't know whether these uh, vote totals, the margin that was attributed to Rauner and Quinn, are true or false. Are they accurate or inaccurate? Why do we not know that? Because the election authorities do not conduct a robust audit of the results, examining a, a certain percentage of the ballots to indicate quickly whether there's an error or fraud. Okay, now, <clears throat> do we want to go into 2018 using the same election system that we had in 2014? I do not want to do that. Okay, now, what can we do as citizens? There is something very concrete and specific that we can do, okay? Um, back in 2007, it's hard to believe 10 years ago, um, I was work I was. Uh, that's when I was uh, chairman of this uh, Illinois Ballot Integrity Project, state chairman. I worked with Bob Wilson and other members of the project, and we introduced through uh, state representative Mike uh, Boland of the Quad Cities uh, the first version of the Illinois Election Integrity Act. And what this uh, act does, if you'll go to your last page of your handout, it's, it would mandate three election audits which, if implemented, would clean up Illinois election systems overnight. Overnight. Okay, what are the audits that would be mandated by House Bill 712, the Illinois Election Integrity Act, 
There is an identical companion bill, Senate Bill 834, introduced by Senator Christina Castro. Okay, they're identical documents, okay? Um, so this legislation, if put into law, would first, number one, require an election day audit consisting of a count of a random sample of 10% of the paper ballots cast in each precinct or 10% of the voter verified paper audit trail, right, uh, that's printed out, that's required by law if you use a touch screen. 10% of those would be uh, selected and counted at random <coughs> in each polling place right when the polls close, okay? Now, this is called universal ballot sampling, okay? Now, if you, if you, if you select 10% of the, of the paper ballots at random, you will create a 99% confidence level and a 1% margin of error. And the thing is, is that you don't have to hire any new personnel because these counts will be done by the judges in the polling places before the ballots can be moved somewhere and tampered with. Okay, so the chain of cut, the custody of the ballots is critical, and they need to be hand counted in the polling places in front of witnesses before they're moved anywhere. You're now, you're here. Right. Okay, yeah. So, so, if, so if, if this, if this, if this audit was done, we would know right away whether there was any kind of error or fraud in our election system, okay? But the, uh, the Illinois Election Integrity Act mandates two additional audits, which would be co conducted by independent, licensed, certified public account auditors, okay? The, this, the, the second audit is what's known as a parallel central tabulation audit, where all votes as cast and recorded on the precinct poll tapes are collected by, uh, they get a copy, so the, the, the CPAs go to the precincts, they get a copy of the poll tape showing the voting results for each of the races in the precinct, they create their own Excel spreadsheet, they independently put in the numbers off of the poll tapes, the hard copy, and then they compare those countywide and statewide totals that they have generated independently on their own Excel spreadsheet with what the county authorities are saying, the election board authorities are saying, what the state board of election is saying, okay? Now the third, uh, in the, the third audit is a pre-election operational audit of election systems that identifies and reports election system security weaknesses together with the steps necessary to remediate the security weaknesses discovered. So what you do is you have the CPAs come in before the election, they study the election system, the, 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 the documentation, the chain of custody, the security of the of voting equipment, all these other issues related to the integrity of the election. Uh, they note deficiencies, they write it up in a report. Uh, these reports are public, they're, they're sent to the election officials, and then hopefully those deficiencies are corrected before the election takes place, okay? Now, what would be the cost to the people of Illinois to fund these three audits? We estimate that it will be roughly $2 million per election, two million for the primary, two million uh, for the general. So that's four million dollars over a two uh, over a uh, uh, two year election cycle, and that comes out to um, I think it was um, I don't know something like eight eight cents per person in, in Illinois. Now, please re remember that the Green Party, in one week, collected seven and a half million dollars in small donations to fund their recounts in Illinois we can collect $4 million to assure the integrity of our elections, both in the primary and the general election, and I'll write the first $100 check. Now here's how this works. The legislation sets up a special uh, uh, ballot integrity fund, election integrity fund, which is administered, will be administered by the State Board of Elections, and it will collect voluntary contributions uh, to fund the, these audits, okay? Now, if there's a deficiency, let's say we can only raise three and a half million, then the state's gonna be on the hook for the other $500,000. But the thing is, is uh, to me, the, one of the first objections that people are gonna raise, oh, how could we possibly afford four million dollars to, uh, to have audits of our elections, you know, in a, where we hit, we're, we're collecting $60 billion a year in revenue in the state. You know, we couldn't possibly afford $4 million out of $60 billion to make sure we have a clean democracy. So, what, what we're encouraging people to do is to contact their state representative and their state senator and say, please co-sponsor, if, if it's your, your state representative, please co-sponsor House Bill 712, 
uh, and vote for it when it comes up. If you to your state senator, please co-sponsor Senate Bill 834 and vote for it uh, when it comes up. We see now in Illinois we could we could set a magnificent example for the rest of, of, the, of the country. But in those states where the Republicans control 32 of the state assemblies, what do you think the chances are yeah. of something like this getting passed into law is? <laughs> See, our window of opportunity is open now, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. We need to get this passed, hopefully this year, but at least early next year in time for the general election, so both the candidates and the citizens and everyone can know that the, the vote totals that are reported by election authorities are true and accurate, and then we have a, we have a functioning democracy. So that's the end of my uh, formal presentation. Okay. Thank you. Now, who, okay, Andy, you want to get up and help moderate? Q&A? Q &A? Q &A? Yeah. Sure. A little bit of Q&A. &A. We'll go about maybe uh, 10 minutes or so, and then we'll go into rebuttals, because I'm sure people are chomping at the bed. <laughs> well, we need answers. answer. Question? Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Oh, wait, is Andy going to yeah, he's going to make it, but take the first question, Mike. Oh, who, who's going to field the questions? You. Okay, all right. Okay, who's, got, who's got their hand up? Mike, he Mike. does. Okay, you're the person yeah. back there. You know, um, this is a state and a national issue. Uh, could you go to Chicago tonight and be on TV or Democracy Now? It would be nice to have this explained to the mass media. Television. Well, you know, you it, Amy Goodman has covered this issue, and there, uh, you know, I think Tom Hartman has been on her show. Well, you would do maybe a much better job than those two. Oh, sure. yeah. oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You think so, Mike? Oh, he'd do a much better job. Yeah, yeah. Than um, well, did we'll, you see, we'll see what happens. <laughs> did, you, did you say you were an accountant? Or uh, I, I'm a CPA, and I, I, I've taught a lot of things along the way as well. And then what are you you're teaching? What are you teaching at Northern? I'm teaching intermediate financial and manager accounting to MBA students and uh, upper upper class. At what institution? Uh, I, I don't, I'd rather not say. Oh, right. Yeah, but it's it, it's a it's a university in the state. Okay. Yeah. All right. Hey, yeah. next. I, I'll be happy to share that with you offline. Mm -hmm. Okay. No problem. Well, well, we can edit that out too. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. This may or may not be in your bailiwick, but in your opinion, yes, sir. as as a election watcher and as a, a auditor and all of that, uh, how serious do you think the speculation is that the Russians were playing around with our elections? Um, I'm going to say I have no useful information to contribute to that question. I have not been studying that issue. To me, that's that's the way of. of of, of creating a diversion, a sidetrack, uh, keeping people away from the real issue that maybe we had Americans who rigged and hacked our election, and we've had Americans who have been rigging and hacking our elections since 2000 and before. So I'm not saying that there hasn't been any outside interference, but I would recommend, you know, so um, I, I, I just say uh, that's not my area, so I can't answer. Yeah. I can answer. Yeah. Briefly, uh, there's all kinds of articles all over the internet, analysts that are saying this thing about Russia 24-7 wall to wall about the Russian attacking it, that's being used as a smoke screen to suppress the massive American hacking and stealing of our elections. That's what that's being used for. It's a giant smoke screen to keep our <coughs> attention off of what he talked about tonight, that our, our elections are massively corrupt and done by Americans. Okay? Okay. Uh, okay, Tim, go ahead. All right, I'd like, to, you know, considering that Cook County has never had a clean election for quite a while, you know, they, they have the dead people voting and vote early, vote often. Cook County still works as a functioning county. Um, I'm kind of wondering what's so new about what we're hearing about, especially when we go back to like Hinky Dink and Bathhouse Jim. Well, the, the thing that what's different now is what can what uh, one or two people can do with a computer keyboard from remote locations where they can it's really hard to stuff 5000 fake ballots into you know ballot boxes where you actually have pieces of paper 
you can flip 5,000 votes on a computer uh, in a matter of 90 seconds, and you can do it remotely. Many of these computer voting systems uh, are accessible from wireless remote locations, so you can be flipping elections, sitting out in the parking lot, you don't even have to be in, 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 the, in the polling place. So that, that and then, then the, 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 so the malicious software that you put in erases itself. So there's no trace that there's been any vote flipping. There's no trace that the malicious. So that's pretty powerful technology. We didn't have that 100 years ago. Any ways they can. Over here. On a philosophical note, I would say that the that by the time you get to the points of what you're talking about, the technical points of whether or not the elections are rigged, how they're rigged. Before you. Excuse me. Louder. Before you get to the point of how the elections are rigged or if they're rigged and who's doing it, shouldn't we be thinking about the idea that democracy in this country as a democratic republic is a joke? It is not a democracy. It is potentially a, an aspiring democratic republic <coughs> if half of the people who are eligible to vote in a national election don't vote, then why are we talking about whether the, the half or less than half that do vote, whether the, election, whether the votes are being hacked or not? Flipped. We should be talking, uh, flipped. Shouldn't we be talking about whether this country is a democracy whether it has any potential to become the democratic republic that it technically is, or whether we're just blowing smoke. Uh, that, that's a really excellent question. And um, Hank Johnson in the 4th District of Georgia, last, last congressional session, introduced H.R. 672. And it's a magnificent piece of legislation uh, that deals with uh, the issues of, of people being prevented from ever even showing up and being able to have their vote flipped. Okay, we call this stripping and flipping, okay? We strip the voter rolls illegally and we bring the margins down close enough, we keep enough of the voters away uh, from the, and then, then it's a lot easier for us to flip 10,000 votes in the state of Wisconsin or flip 13,000 votes. Okay, Greg Palast, who many of you guys know, He's been specializing in, in the stripping, which is just as vital as what I'm talking about. Our Election Integrity Act only deals with the system once the voter's in the ballot box and is casting the votes. But your point is, is excellent. Now, here's what Greg Palast uh, wrote on Friday, November the 11th. <clears throat> the system called Crosscheck is detailed in my Rolling Stone report. Okay, and this is a system that was, it's been created by Republicans, the Secretaries of States. Cross-check in action. Uh, Trump victory in margin, his, his reported margin of victory, 13,107 votes. Uh, legitimate voters purged through cross-check in Michigan, 449,922. Margin 13,000, stripping 449. <coughs> in Arizona, uh, Trump victory in Arizona, margin 85,257. <coughs> Cross check purge, legal voters illegally stripped 270,824 uh, voters. <coughs> I got it. Trump margin in North Carolina, 177,008 votes. North Carolina purges through cross check. 589,393 votes. This election was stolen before we even got to the ballot box. And then that's not counting the voters subtracted. Yeah, the just, voter ID laws. That's just, yeah. that's just the the illegal, stripping stri the, illegal stripping. Of the role. Illegal that's purging not, of, yeah, of, of, that's, of registered that's voters. That's not counting suppression. And strip numbers. and flip. That's the technique. Right. Strip and flip. Was there, was there any hacking in uh, Obama's election? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the United States Census Bureau conducts election, <coughs> national election surveys, asking you know, people if they voted, okay? And John Simon in, of the Election Defense Alliance 
uh, they did, uh, uh, they wrote an article called Landslide Denied. And basically, uh, in, in 2008, uh, I, think, I think it was 2008, uh, basically they calculated that Obama lost about three to six million votes uh, nationwide that were either, uh, that, that, you know, that were flipped or they weren't counted. See, uh, another thing you do is that you don't count provisional ballots. You don't count absentee ballots. You don't go, and, and if the, op see, you can alter the ballot definition on the OptiScan card reader enough so that it'll, it'll, it, will, it, will, it, will, it won't register a vote for the presidential campaign. So, so like in, in Detroit, the Detroit area, I think it was Wayne County, there were like 60,000 spoiled ballots. Uh, the, 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 where the OptiScan machine did not record the vote was cast for president. Well, in Michigan, uh, Trump's uh, alleged margin of victory was 13,107. And here you have, I think, in the Detroit area, 60,000 spoil ballots that were not even allowed to be counted. So the, the, the early vote, the uh, provisional votes aren't counting, the mail-in votes don't necessarily be counting, spoiled ballots are counting, so all sorts of, so that's how Obama could lose three to six million votes, uh, even though he won. They weren't able to, they weren't able to strip and flip enough in those two elections, but, uh, but he, uh, they, he lost millions and millions, I think, in both. Back there. Uh, I was wondering about these uh, mail-in ballots. Has there been any study on uh, mail-in ballots and how they're being uh, yeah, but see, um, as, as a, speaking as a professional auditor, to me, the chain of custody and the security of the ballots once they arrive at the election authority is paramount. I am not comfortable with a mail-in, personally, a mail-in election system. I think our safest election system would be to have voters show up on election day cast their votes on, 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 on paper ballots in the presence of, 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 uh, of poll watchers and, and elected officials and, and, uh, and uh, 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 judges and, and, and so on, uh, and, then, and then have 10% them, have of them hand counted, uh, uh, randomly selected. That would be great. Now, I don't think we're going to get away with early voting, okay, in Illinois. And there are a lot of, there are a lot of good arguments uh, to have early voting. There, there really are. But what we have to do is figure out how can we secure uh, we, we need to have early voting on paper ballots that are absolutely secured until election day and then they're counted, uh, run through the machines and then 10% of those are counted. Because I think we have a, a significant vulnerability of the early votes. Because these machines are sitting around in schools and libraries or wherever for weeks and weeks uh, and, they, and people could come in and, and, and tamper with those, with those, vote, with those programs, the programs that count the votes. Yes. Yes. Also, have the voting, the voting be on a Sunday or a holiday? Sure. Uh, yeah. Pizza, pizza question, yeah. Uh, people, there's there's been uh, a lot of talk and support about like voting holidays or having like maybe three or four days where people can go in and vote, and they could do that then in the polling places uh, with the greater security and integrity, and you wouldn't have to leave these ballots and the machines sitting around for weeks unattended. Other questions? We'll go to rebuttals soon then if your questions are tapering. I off. think it's time to go to rebuttals. Okay, give the speaker a hand. Okay, let's guys, get you guys up to rebuttals. Andy, you know how to you we'll say about four minutes, okay? Yeah, we'll uh, we'll go uh, with four minutes per person for rebuttal tonight. So, uh, yeah, form a line up here uh, along that rail. That'll be like the on deck circle in baseball. Okay, let's so give we'll, our speaker. Don't clog the aisle here. The waitress has don't to walk through that, that, please. Let's give our we speaker a big gap here and stay on the outside of the rail down there. For let's anybody give that wants to give a rebuttal. Well, we have a show of hands. Uh, who, who wants to give a rebuttal? We'll hold your hands up and we'll get a count. Two, three, four, five back there. Tim is six, seven, right. well, eight. Yeah, uh, for four minutes apiece will be just about yeah. the right time, and then the speaker will have the last word. Okay. Uh, All right, Andy, before so, we do that, let's give our speaker one more round of applause. Give our speaker another round of applause. Yeah. Yes, his, his talk was one of the most refreshing reality based talks we've had here in a long time. 
Thank you very much. My pleasure. All right, Andy. <laughs> Thank you, the speaker, for uh, outstanding, probably one of the best presentations we've ever had. There ain't nothing all can't do. There ain't nothing all can't dream. There ain't no day that can't be new. Break the chains till all are free. There ain't nothing we can't do. There's nothing we can't dream. There ain't no day that can't be new. There ain't nothing we can't be. Remember we, me and you. There ain't no goal that we can't reach. Remember me and you, solidarity. Remember we, me and you, keep on, keep on, keep. For the land of and the home, we the people, we. In uh, Civil Disobedience, Henry David Thoreau once wrote, I ask for not at once no government, but at once a better government. And I think that's what we're all in America feeling right now in the last seven and a half months is, uh, you know, we can either give up and either just consume all the breads and circuses and distractions that this amazing thing called capitalism provides us with every second of our lives, or move out of the country, or secede from, I don't know what you would secede from. There's only one Earth. We're here. We have to deal with the fact that as humans, we're not perfect. And the government is just like human beings. It has to evolve, it has to strengthen, it has to practice its skills to be the best it can possibly be. So when Henry David Thoreau says he doesn't ask for once no government, um, he's saying strongest disagreement possible with what we currently have in Trump and Pence. Uh, they're saying government's role is to not govern. In fact, it's even worse than not governing. Trump and Pence uh, philosophy on the role of legislators is to ungovern, literally take us backwards in time, to ignore science, to ignore math, to ignore uh, basic uh, history and common sense. Here's what it looks like in other parts of the world where, uh, yeah, you have Trump and Pence's on the ballot, but nobody votes for him for some reason. Places like Iceland, Sweden, Norway, Finland, Denmark. You have anti-gerrymandering laws. You have no cross-check and no voter suppression. You have more polling places that are accessible to the disability community and seniors and veterans and people who work. You have paper ballots for each voter. You don't have vote shifting machines. You have early voting available to all communities. You had extended voting hours on the weekend prior to election day. You have half day holidays where people can choose either morning or night to vote. You have public financing for all campaigns, free media time for all candidates. You don't have an electoral college. And by the way, every time you meet in a town hall meeting with your local, state, or federal legislators, ask them if they drive in a motor vehicle with stone square wheels or round rubber wheels. And if their answer is they drive in a motor vehicle with round rubber wheels, then say, why do we have the electoral college then? Because that is the equivalent of having a vehicle with stone square wheels. It gets you nowhere. It's in defiance of basic math. When you watch your favorite sports teams, let's say the team down the street that won the World Series last year, okay, if one team has more runs than the other, the referee, in an arbitrary exercise of ridiculousness, doesn't say, how I feel decides who won. No, whoever got the most votes won. And, you know, admittedly, I don't think that would have been a victory. We still would have all lost if the person who got the most votes last year would have won. Either, either of those two, we all lost. It wasn't Bernie Sanders. I know that much. They also, in those other countries that I mentioned, have universal automatic voter registration. They have proportional representation, instant runoff voting, no confidence vote, and a write-in option. It's up to us. It's up to we, the people. We have to demand better government, not no government. Thank you to the speaker. Give me a one minute warning and wave your hand. I can't see very well. Uh, the, the previous rebutter took some, a lot of my points. You did a great job. 
Uh, again, I want to say I believe in what Carl Schur said, my country right or wrong, when right to be kept right, when wrong to be put right. He was a Republican. They were better in that century. So what are we going to do? As far as I'm concerned, and I think uh, somebody put this in a question, I don't think we're much of a democracy. We could all list in five or six minutes or seven minutes 10 or 12 reasons why we're not much of a democracy. You mentioned the electoral college, uh, two senators from every state, uh, all that, that kind of thing, uh, Citizens United, on and on and on and on. As far as I'm concerned now, we've got an oligarchy that runs this country for a plutocracy. Uh, I admit that if I were young and if I were ambitious and if I were flexible, none of these things are true. I'd leave. I'd leave. There are other countries. They mentioned the Nordic countries. I would add New Zealand. I would add Canada. You get better health care there, too. There's better health care there, too. But we lied about our history. We're a bunch of liars about our history. Uh, Lies my teacher told me, James Lowen, read that book. You can read other books. Uh, Why America Failed, Morris Berman. So what can we do? Since I'm old, I'm going to stay and fight. But right. <laughs> if again, if I were young, if I were 18, 20, 22, 24, hey, what the hell? Why not go to Canada? You can always go to Florida in the, in the winter if it's too oh. So anyway, we, we certainly want to do things. Uh, I would say if you're old, why don't you join Jane Addams Senior Caucus? I'm going to give this to Anna Marin, this material that I got, and she is head of movement politics at Jane Addams Senior Caucus. Maybe we'll do something. Maybe we'll have Professor quick talk to us. Maybe we'll read this material. Maybe we'll do something in Illinois. Boy, oh boy, we better do something in Illinois. End of story. <laughs> oh boy, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Injured veteran. I turned 85 on Flag Day, so you can also look. <laughs> um, speaking of Canada, someone published a map about 15 years ago or more that showed the liberal states on the west coast and Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and the New England, New York, and New England states all joining Canada, all joining Canada for a United States of Canada. And guess what? The remaining states of the United States was called, were called at that time. No one ever saw that map. Huh? Jesus Land. <laughs> uh, I think we've gone beyond that. We are in a war. And in a war, you've got to use your imagination to develop your strategies. I, I must tell you, Mr. Quick, the work you're doing is fantastic. I want to join and help you in certain regards that I'm an expert in. I, was, I earned my living as an advertising copywriter and a public relations writer and a news writer uh, when I had a career. And maybe I can give you some help along those lines. We welcome you. Yes, oh, please. Thank you. I've, I've, I've developed a strategy that no one has ever thought of. Maybe it's unconstitutional. I don't think so. I didn't do the research. Here it is. If the Democrats are really interested in fighting a war, the Democrats in Illinois, I'm going to send a proposal to Mike Madigan. Uh, maybe someone here knows constitutional law. They will prove to me this is unconstitutional. I don't think so. But even things that are unconstitutional it takes five or ten years to go through the courts before they're struck down. So here's the strategy. The state of Illinois has, under the federal constitution, the right to define citizenship in Illinois. We can grant honorary citizenship to the Queen of England, and she could vote in Illinois. Perfectly legal, as I understand it from the Constitution. Okay, 
Republicans are depriving people of their right to vote all over the place, Ohio and whatnot. A lot of black people, a lot of Democrats. Illinois could revise the standards of citizenship to make it possible for any <coughs> citizen of the state of the United States to register as a citizen of Illinois and get the vote there. There'd be two or three hundred thousand people in Ohio that we could sell this to. They've been deprived of the vote. Here, we're going to give you a vote. And then, so Illinois would send registrars, perfectly legal, I believe, oh, I'm sure they go into the courts to block it, to Ohio to register people in Cleveland, Columbus, etc. And then in addition to the registrars, Mike Madigan and the, and the boys would send Democratic operatives completely separate from the registrars, they having no su such responsibility or duties, and they would say to the people who, when, when they're coming out of the registration office, you've registered in Illinois, now we'd like you, or maybe they have to say it beforehand, register in this district or that district where there's a strong Republican majority, we can get enough people from Ohio and Florida and whatnot registered uh, as mostly as Democrats to turn the entire Illinois legislature Democratic. Now, I don't think they'll do it, but I want to send the proposal to Mike Madigan, get his answer, and publish it all. Now, that would be, um, the Republicans have gone beyond the Constitution, beyond the laws, and that's what those, anyone who wants to fight them needs to do. And I just want, want to leave you with the image of James Madison. When he finished helping to write the Constitution in Philadelphia, he went across the street to the stables, got on his horse, and rode lickety split back to Virginia to enter the election. He got there on election day. He was able to register and present himself as a candidate. And of course, at that time, the voters all gathered at the polls. To, to, they could see each other, like us. We can raise our hands and vote. And he got elected. We've gone beyond that in technology and in mass numbers. We have to move back toward local community involvement and control. But in the meantime, I want to see if the Democrats are really ready to fight this war in defense of the Republic. I don't think they are, but I want to give them a chance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Introduce yourself, Pat. I'm uh, Pat Butler, uh, uh, a longtime uh, habitué uh, of this place, and uh, like uh, the uh, previous uh, speaker, uh, I uh, have been a, and am a newspaper reporter. I have worked in advertising. I have done some of the same things that this gentleman uh, has uh, on his list of achievements. Um, one of my favorite movies, as some of you know, uh, is Gangs of New York. When my daughter and I saw it, when it first came out, she said, Dad, that's our going with the wind. And there's one line in there, and I don't know if you'll remember it, where uh, Tammany Hall is uh, getting out the vote, and some of the Tammany workers are instructed to take the names off the gravestones and register those people, pointing out your citizenship and your duty to your new country does not end just because you are dead. <laughs> Fast forward to the 1950s, the early 1950s, uh, an eight-year-old on the north side is watching his father, uh, who was a professional campaign organizer, and he's going through some names uh, on the voter roster. And they're taking the names from a list of names from um, Calvary Cemetery. <laughs> and this kid mentioned to his father, Dad, do you know that half of those guys were killed in the Civil War? And this guy's father said, good Lord, we sent you to a Catholic school 
and you don't believe in eternal life. <laughs> this kind of thing is an old Chicago tradition. Long before there were computers, it was possible to do some of these same things by taking a small piece of lead, putting it under your finger, and when you are counting the ballots, you flatten them out. While you're flattening them out, you mark an X. Anywhere on any other name, you have just spoiled the ballot. That means that that ballot is disqualified, and you have only those ballots uh, for candidates that uh, you wanted to be uh, <coughs> counted. <coughs> we're still doing the same things today, only we're doing it uh, high tech. Um, human nature <coughs> is human nature. We're going to continue doing this until more and more people, like this gentleman and others, insist that we be a little more vigilant <coughs> as to how our votes are counted. Once we turn in our ballots, we expect that they're going to be handled properly. More often than not, they are. But there are always times when even in this day of civic virtue, uh, and reform and all of that kind of thing, uh, we still have a certain amount of chicanery going on. It goes on because a lot of people don't pay much attention to what's going on around them. Don't pay much attention to what groups like this gentleman's group are trying to do. Um, <clears throat> we will never reach a f uh, point in our history when we will never need to continue the process of reform. One of the reforms, incidentally, that I would like to see done, and I think a lot of people here, would be the abolition of the Electoral College. Why? The Electoral College was originally founded to keep, not to act as a, a, a check and balance, the Electoral College was originally founded to keep the votes of the riffraff from being counted. Now, that's us, folks. Unless you own property, and unless you go to the right church, in those days, you were riffraff. You know, you still are if you're not vigilant and don't continue watching what's going on today. Uh, I'm about to have the platform pulled from under me. <laughs> and uh, usually when that happens, there's a rope at the end of the other side of the platform. Uh, so uh, we'll continue this. Ted, 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 all right, who wants to hear Sean Spicer imitations? So I'm glad he's sticking in there. <laughs> uh, he hasn't been canned yet, so I'll have to work on that. Um, very good speaker tonight. I, I'm always, um, you know, so pleased when we have a really good expert, even though he's incognito. Uh, really says a lot about where our society is now that we can't even identify our speaker anymore because of uh, various reasons. But please, you're an expert in the field, you know more than anybody in the media, I guarantee you on this subject matter, which is very important, go to Chicago tonight because they have very good mm -hmm. staff there. Go to Democracy Now! in New York, they'll pay for your airfare. <laughs> uh, democracy Now! Uh, get the story out, because there's I don't want to hear mealy mouth politicians or other screwballs explain the problems in our election, our elected, uh, election systems. Now, I worked for Diebold, which is one of the big electronic voting machine companies now. And I believe when I left there, about 2000, uh, they bought the election machine division of a company in Brazil. And I think that's when elect electronic computer uh, Voting became popular right? about 2000. Well, started going in 2002, four billion dollars was given to the states to go out and buy computerized voting systems. We had computer voting equipment prior to 2002, but that was when the floodgates opened and they, they you know, they were implemented all over the country. Okay. Yeah. 
And T Bold is what I was. I only spent a couple of years with there. I like always work with sort of companies, but uh, but T Bold was uh, in banking, of course, and the, uh, it's very very conservative. So it, it doesn't surprise me at, at all that they have a lot of gateways and backdoors, ways to hack into their machinery and electronics. I've always been in technology, selling computers to computers and. You know, there's just so many ways to get into a computer or get hacked or find ways in, and it's complicated. And <coughs> so it's, it's just a shame in this country that we get, we get uh, hacked on our elections. So I was very impressed with this um, uh, presentation. I hope you go forward and get more, uh, you know, publicity for it. People we that are, are experts we're, we're planning on should it, yes. be out there out front because otherwise just the, the money, big money, and uh, the bad politicians are going to get the publicity, and uh, that was about all I had to say. Thanks. And I'll throw in my own. Thank you very much. I don't believe You know, we talk about things like the voting registration rolls and verifying our identities and knowing who we're voting for and, and the secret ballot and everything else. To me, a vote should be as simple as going in, casting a ballot, having it counted. I mean, we know how to do this already because you know something? I could take a device like this mm -hmm. at any gas station, any damn merchant in the country, almost down to the penny, not request a receipt, and see the thing online within seconds <coughs> and it being accurate. <laughs> the vote back in 1994 when I did a little bit of volunteering for one of the congressional elections they had maps and data sets of people who voted what party so that means when you're a phone bank you know who to call and who not to call you have records of transactions you have databases of people now that it should be a very easy thing to you know, if, if a guy moves in a voter registration list, it would be easy to verify. There's a company out in, uh, I think it's Naperville somewhere, called Axicon. They do a lot. They're the ones that have a, a rec the official record on you for all your financial transactions, all your things, and the data is available for whoever wants it to be bought and sold. I mean, you know, this is almost, to me, in a sense, ridiculous <clears throat> that we even have to sit here and talk about voter integrity when we've already got the places and the systems in place for verification. We should be able just to go in, as we do now, into our driver's license facility, register to vote. They know where you live when they issue tickets. Surely we could have a voter registration or voter verification and registration list that's correlated well. I mean, it, if we can do it with a credit card transaction, we can go to Amazon and get our packages shipped the same day. They even have automatic verification now that if you move, they'll forward the package to you. All kinds of things that, you know, we as consumers don't even know about. And yet, many of you are talking like it's the 1960s. Voter acts, voter this. Well, if it's so easy, why isn't it already in effect? Because a lot of times our politicians and the powers that be are not using some common sense. How do you get them to use common sense? You have to get organizations like his to start using it. The point of the matter for me is this should be a real non issue. There are so much more ways to verify and count. And don't get me wrong, computers in the past have swung elections. In 1953, Dewey and Truman, the first election that was predicted by the UNIVAC computer, and CBS didn't believe it. The next morning, Truman won. So it's not the computer's fault, it's the data that goes in, and possibly maybe the manipulation of the polls. <laughs> We have some very powerful tools. We have the data. We're just not choosing to use it properly. Thank you.
Freedom from religion. Okay? Freedom from religion means that there's a separation of church and state, and you can't mix the two. The United States has something called freedom of religion. Freedom of religion also is a separation of church and state. But you can do whatever you want. Okay? Here we have Amish, we have Muslims, we have all sorts of things. America is a very wonderful place. You have Republicans and Democrats who are assholes. <laughs> <laughs> but you have a lot who are just interested in honest government, a fair shake, and it's just the American way. Okay? Um, this is a very wonderful place. The thing about, that was just brought up, on um, changing, on um, why is it so hard when we do credit card transactions so simply? I was talking to someone else a while ago, and he told me, he said, you know, the electric motor was developed in like the 1880s, mm -hmm. all right? And it took 30 years for that electric motor to be incorporated into production, into assembly lines and anything else that had to do where we just commonly see them today. And he goes, you know why it took 30 years to do that? Because all the old managers had to die. Because the old managers are like, what? Move into electric? We got this steam thing here. It gives us heat. We know how to manage it, everything. It's perfect. It's been this way for 10 years. They all had to die. And the thing with like what's going on now with the information systems and everything else that has to do with kids, computers, phones, and stuff like that, it's the same thing. And it has to do with what was just brought up. Why is elections? Why are we thinking in 18th, 17th, 18th, and 19th century, early 20th century terms, on um, holding elections? It's because, you know, we all have to die. And then the new kids will be like, well, no, you don't do it that way, you do it this way. And it'd be like, oh, geez, sure. Um, I'm glad you had gave us an excellent talk pointed out things I wasn't aware of, uh, very serious things. Why the Democrats are lame, I have no idea. It's to their embarrassment. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. There was eight of us, right? Oh, that was seven. All right. Uh, again, I'd like to thank our speaker for hitting a lot of good points about what's happening in America. Tom Hartman points out all the time that no Republican has gotten control of the White House without massive treason and criminal activity since Eisenhower. Every Republican that's been installed in the White House has been installed through massive criminal activity and treason against the American people and the Constitution. That's number one. Number two, uh, Supreme Court Justice Lewis Powell, before he became a Supreme Court Justice, he put out what was called a Powell Memo back in, I think it was 1973. And that was a, a memo to the Chamber of Commerce and other rich people's organizations, a coalition of businesses saying, 
we have to start taking the country back. There's too much democracy. The middle class is getting too much wealth. We have to start taking it back and shifting the wealth and the income on up to the super rich. And we're that started in 1973, and it really picked up speed with the election of Ronald Reagan, the installation of Ronald Reagan, really, on uh, running on the idea that we were, quote, behind the Soviets. We had to build up our military. That was one of the most outrageous of pieces of mythology that the media has ever perpetrated on us. There are several Republican operatives have been talking about the Trump administration. And everything, the reason that Trump was installed rather than a Democrat is because the Republicans have been, have been holding up President Obama's nomination for the courts. There's over 100 vacancies from the federal courts, including the one Supreme Court vacancy, that have been held up since the Republicans got control of the Senate and the Congress. They want to pack the courts with politicians in judges' robes it will come from a, something called the Federalist Society that was reported and you know, uh, formed in 1980. These people aren't judges. They're masquerading as judges, but they're, they're politicians that are willing to disgrace themselves periodically to make a ruling that will shift the direction that America is moving in. Here, here. Citizens United ruling was one of them where they said basically it's all right now for rich people to buy and sell and own their own private politicians. Any number, and this is what we've got. The Senate, the Republican Senate and Congress and some of the Democrats make up what is, I call, the smoothest running, best financed intellectual whorehouse on the planet. <laughs> if you look it up in the dictionary, there's two definitions of prostitution. One of them is women selling sex. The other definition is what our Congress critters are doing for money. And until we address these issues, we're not going to make any progress in America. Last year, as he, our speaker talked about, he probably didn't mention that currently, today, in Trump, Trump, Trump country where people voted for Trump in massive numbers, people that are being hurt by Trump's policies, the most popular politician in America is Bernie Sanders. He speaks to the needs of the American people. The media absolutely buried Bernie Sanders with false, uh, disgraceful media coverage. They made a deal with the Clinton campaign where we said, we will bury Bernie for you if you will do good things for us after you get in the White House. The Republican operatives who had a, um, I'll finish here in just 30 seconds. Uh, well, uh, yeah. The Republicans ran a clean primary on their side because they wanted Trump all along. They wanted somebody with enough workable digits to sign his name to whatever papers they shoved in front of his face. The Democratic primary was the most corrupt Democratic primary in the history of our country. Bernie won it by millions of votes, and the media just kept reporting day after day that he was losing. That's where we are. So um, hopefully Tim and Charlie are going to give a presentation on fake news versus real news, right? Yes. What day is that? That's next week. Next week. So and if you want to hear a really stimulating presentation about fake news versus real news, come see us next week. Okay. Again, just a brief announcement. This room will be used for a graduation party from the owner of the restaurant. We're going to be in the back room. Yeah, we'll be in the back. Next week. They okay. requested we have no amplification, but I think Charlie and myself will be loud enough so that everybody can hear. Well, yeah, if the speaker stands there and it faces the wall, I think we'll be okay and we won't uh, contaminate the rest of the restaurant with too much noise. We should be okay the way those tables are laid out. So uh, once again, our speaker gets the last word. If he's ready to give a slight summary, uh, come on up and give him a hand again. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I think it's really wonderful that you're taking your valuable time and coming here to learn about 
these important issues to, to get engaged, to you know, to uh, to share your thoughts and ideas uh, for what we need to do. Um, I think it's amazing that this uh, organization has been going longer uh, than I've been alive. Uh, uh, was this the original podium? No. No. <laughs> okay. it's, been around, it's been around since the 90s, though. Anyway, I love this. This is, this is going to be my favorite podium. There's so much love energy that's been imbued into this podium. I can just feel it. Um, it contains slivers of the original podium. Oh, okay. okay. Anyway, um, the thing that I would like to ask for you uh, now is that the wonderful thing about this Selection Integrity Act is that it's a single solution to a complex problem. And so if you ask, well, I want, if you say, I want honest and accurate elections in Illinois and around the rest of the country, what can we do? Because, you know, these election systems, they're complex. They have all sorts of interdependent parts. Things are going on invisibly. And so my answer to you is 712 and 834. House Bill 712, Senate Bill 834. Please uh, contact your state senator, your state representative, and say, we can no longer afford to have insecure election systems. Uh, uh, this, the, these audits can be paid for with voluntary contributions. Okay, we don't have to tax the, the uh, operating budget of the state. And there is no good reason not to support these three election audits that will assure that our, our elections are clean and accurate and our candidates and the public can have confidence in the results. Now, I have up here a little brochure. Yeah, sure. Uh, put out by the Illinois Vial Integrity Project and uh, a card uh, with information on our upcoming conference in Naperville. It's, it's at Winfield Road on, uh, off of I-88. Uh, I really encourage uh, you, if you would be interested in coming uh, or bringing uh, people that you know, we're hoping we're going to invite all the state senators and all the state representatives uh, to this conference. Uh, it's a Saturday. <coughs> our first session is going to be from 10 until noon, and then we're going to have uh, an additional session for people who want more in-depth coverage. But if you could get the word out about the conference, if you get the word out about the legislation, and right now we're trying to organize a statewide campaign, so we're looking to create groups within different localities and areas who would be willing to organize outreaches to the state representatives and the state senators uh, so that they know we, we really want uh, and insist upon this legislation. So if anyone who would be interested in joining the cause, uh, please come up to the table. I can give you my card. I can give you additional information. Uh, but, with a, but I can't do this by myself, okay? Uh, four or five people are not going to get this legislation uh, through by themselves because there is resistance, okay? Uh, and, and so it's going to take a, a, a groundswell of public support <clears throat> to get this in, in, in place for the 2018 election. So anyway, thank you for your time. Uh, have a great evening. And... Uh, We'll see you around. Okay. Hold on, hold on. Honey, do you need a box? No, no thanks. Uh, that will be just about it. I have one final announcement that I forgot to mention when I was up here. I'll probably mention it every week now for the next few weeks until everybody's tired of hearing about it. Naomi Klein has got a new book out called No Is Not Enough. It's not enough for us to say no. We don't like what's going on. We have to get involved any way we can. Her book is loaded with all kinds of beneficial examples of what people are doing all over the country and all over the world. If you want hope for the future, and that it's still possible we can change things, get a copy of that paperback book. It's called No Is Not Enough. It came out Friday a week ago. It's brand new. It's the single most hopeful book I've seen in 10 years about what we can do to change the direction of America and follow the example you know, like they were talking about other countries are doing things uh, that are way ahead of us socially and environmentally and everything else. Her book summarizes that. Again, it's called No Is Not Enough by Naomi Klein. Gavel so, us out, Andy. What? Gavel us out. Uh, Tim says we have to gavel us out. Okay, that's it for tonight. <laughs> Thank you. We gavel us out. Thank you all for coming, and we will see you next week at the College Complex.